And welcome back to a fresh episode of the Business Growth Show. I'm your host, Sam Dunning, and co-owner over at webchoiceuk.com. And today I'm joined by Phil Agnew. Phil is a senior product marketer over at Hotjar, product marketing ambassador at the PMA, and he's host of Nudge, the only podcast that's dedicated to consumer psychology. Phil, a very warm welcome to the show, sir. How are you doing? Hi, Sam. Really good, thank you. Thank you so much for having me, and thanks for that warm, warm welcome there. No worries, man. So looking forward to, to this one. Um, we're going to be talking about a fresh topic for the show. We're going to be talking all about how nudges can make our brands really stand out. So first and foremost, Phil, what the hell is a nudge? <laughs> what is a nudge? Good question. Um, so nudging is, is the idea that we can change the behavior of the consumers that we're trying to influence without big shoves, without huge marketing campaigns, without spending thousands of pounds on over the line marketing. We can do it with small, subtle changes to our messaging, to our design, to our positioning, whatever it might be, um, to subtly push them in the direction that we want them to go. Um, there are hundreds of ex examples that I'm sure I'll give you along the way, but it's all about yep. smaller interventions that you can make to your to your marketing to try and encourage action. Got it. Okay, so we're talking kind of small incremental little changes that can, are we talking about kind of helping us achieve our kind of end, end result in terms of whether that's kind of building brand awareness, driving sales, driving lead conversions, these kind of things, right? That's the thing. And, and another thing to call out, Sam, is that a nudge, it will not ensure action from someone. So it's not going to force somebody to click your CTA or sign up yep. to your webinar or whatever it might be. Okay. But it just increases the likelihood that they will. So it's not a shove, it's a subtle nudge. Um, and to understand and, and implement nudges, you need a good experiment culture. You need to understand you know, split testing and A-B testing to see what works. And you have to have a good understanding of the science behind the psychology as well. Yep. Once you get those two things, it's a, it's a marketer's dream because you've got the inspiration you need to create campaigns that really work. And you've got the, the sort of expertise and skill set to actually make improvements that, that drive change. Got it. Okay. And is this something, Phil, that any business can implement? Or is it specific to certain niches? Or tell us a bit more about who can apply it. That's a good question. Um, my assumption is that there's there's really no limit about who can apply it. There's probably a few guardrails that I would encourage every business to put in place if you are going to start to use consumer psychology and behavior science in your work. One of those is what I've already mentioned, so an experimentation culture. Um, as, as you said at the start, I work at Hotjar, and I'm, I'm really lucky at Hotjar to be in a company that has an incredible experimentation culture. So they've got heaps of guardrails in place to make sure that all our experiments are not only really well documented, so we can all learn from one another, but they all yeah. follow the same framework. So when we yeah. are experimenting, um, we're doing it in a way which we can rely on and that we, that we know will get valuable results, statistical significance, that sort of thing. So getting that in place is important for any business and getting that setup is useful it's often worth pulling in an expert to help you set up a, a good experimentation culture as well so if you're thinking about it do look at that and then the other thing is just understanding the science so understanding some of the, the consumer psychology and the behavior science as i mentioned and that you don't need a degree to do that you don't need to go get a master's degree um you probably need a bit of a, a love and interest in in the field and you probably want to be a bit of a keen reader as well so if you're reading books like influence by Cialadini, choice factory by richard shotton uh, blind sight by prince of mcgoomen you know these are books that will really help you understand the field and then you can sort of build out your knowledge from there start testing things figure out what works and apply them to your business Makes sense. Okay. Um, so we'll dive into a bit more about how we can use nudges effectively for our businesses in a bit. Um, now moving to, to the standout part of the show, why is it that you think that most marketing tends to be quite generic when we look at a lot of companies, perhaps new companies that perhaps don't have in-house marketing teams or maybe just want to bring something to the market fast? They, they their, their website headlines, their, their ad copies, what they're putting out just tends to blend in with the rest of the noise. Um, what's what's the science behind this? Why is it important that we do stand out, Phil? So I think the first thing to mention here is risk. Now, when you're a marketer, you, you have a risky job. The, the content, the marketing, the messaging, the positioning you create is seen and analysed by the wider world. 
And this is a risky job because it means that if you get something wrong, it's visible to, to many, many eyeballs. And that risk means that we tend to take quite risk averse actions. One of the clear things that marketers tend to do is to look at competitors in the marketplace, see what appears to be working in their field, take elements of those campaigns and apply them to their own campaigns. And you'll see this um, in every single industry. So if you look at um, gambling firms, they all right. sponsor the same entities. They all sponsor Premier League and Championship clubs in the UK, sure. equivalent in, in other parts of Europe. So 19 out of the 24 Championship clubs in the UK are sponsored by gambling firms. This is the shirt sponsor, so the main sponsor, 11 of the 20 Premier League clubs. Same for lager brands. They, they all have, over the period, over the last uh, 10 years, sponsored the League Cup, the FA Cup, the Champions League, and the Premier League. This is this is really, yep. really common. Um, but it's not just those sort of big advertising fields. It's other places as well. So if you look at um, the SaaS industry, for example, there is a huge um, amount of SaaS companies that have very similar designs at the moment. So Cartini abstract style designs we've all pictured them on websites and landing pages it's very very similar same can be said about pricing everybody has three tiers with the middle one being the most popular same can be said about website design and there are benefits to this there are benefits to this because you are building on a mental model that consumers understand there's also a massive negative as well okay. eight out of ten product launches fail according to hbr 25 percent of marketing budget is wasted according to e-commerce there's a lot of inefficiency in our job there's a lot of um, unaffected marketing and i think a problem with that is because a lot of marketing blends in and a lot of marketing is not unique and if you want the crystal clear number one example of this go look at yep. any advert for a watch and you'll you'll look at that advert not only will it look amazingly similar because they will look similar anyway but the watch will be set to the same time in every single advert that's how much we like to copy competitors and, and stay risk averse oh well i've never noticed that well they're always the same time are they always about 10 minutes past 10 it's the same from omega to, to apple watch as well cool amazing all right so getting this this is interesting so getting into the risk side of things like you say um i'm sure there's many startups are the same that perhaps they're bringing a product to market and they're, they're just thinking like these competitors have got some cool aspects, whether it is on their website, marketing, print material, design material, ad material. Why not just copy what, what they're doing? That seems to work. They seem to generate good revenue. What What's the problem here, Phil? Is it just that it doesn't break through the noise? Is it because our prospects, our customers have just seen it a hundred times before? Is that is that what the issue is here? And is that what the problem is? Or is it something a bit deeper? The problem really, Sam, is the... The science tells us something different. So if you look at the science behind what attracts attention and what generates recall, blandness and sameness isn't that. So this goes way back to 1933 with a researcher called Hedwig von Resteroff. Um, she was doing a lot of studies around understanding memory and recall in Berlin at the time. And she gave participants long lists, long sequences of letters to remember. But hidden, well, not hidden, just within those lists of sequences of letters to remember, so ABC, WDS, RDE, all these random different letter combinations. Within those combinations, there would be three numbers to remember as well. She would ask participants at the end what they remembered, and the numbers were 30 times more likely to be remembered. So when something is distinct, we are more likely to remember it. Richard Shotton, brilliant uh, behavioral scientist who applies this stuff to modern day marketing, did the same study, but for brands in 2018. He gave participants a, a long number of different um, automotive brands um, to remember. So all brands from an automotive company said, look at all these different logos from automotive companies. These are well-known brands. Mercedes, yep. BMW, you know, you know them yourself. But within there, he put a fast food brand. So he put one distinctive brand, one brand that stood out, one which was different from the rest. That brand was four times more likely to be remembered. Wherever we look, there are examples of distinctiveness paying off. If you put a post-it note on a um, Irish tax collector survey, it generates double the amount of um, respondents when you send that post-it note in a letter. Same can be said for Australia tax collectors as well. They put a big stamp on their letter saying urgent. They generated one million more dollars in um, ta tax collection and stopped late fines going through. Countless examples of where distinctiveness pays off. Wherever we look time and time again, it seems to work. Problem is, it's a risky thing. 
that we mm. should be changing our mental model here. We shouldn't see being distinct of ri as risky. We should actually see it as the least risky option because if you don't stand out, if you copy competitors, you'll only blend in and you'll only be far less likely to be recalled, remembered and, and acted upon. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. And I guess especially if you're in a saturated market where there's a heck of a lot of competition, if you're just doing the exact same as, as everyone else, whether that is with, I don't know, TV ads, radio ads, your, your website, your digital marketing, um, and it all kind of blends into one, like you said, what's, what's to make someone use you rather than a competitor that's perhaps doing what you do, maybe better, maybe they've got a better team, maybe they've got better support, whatever, um, what's making you stand out. So are there some best practices, Phil, that we need to consider before just saying, well, everyone else has got 10 past 10 on their watch ad. I'm going to do 12 <laughs> past 10 and I'm going to have a green watch and I'm going to do it whilst I'm on an aeroplane. Um, <laughs> is, is, it, is it going back to the nudge that, um, reference where we need to do everything kind of in small chunks or are there some best plays here? Uh, big time. And, uh, you know, I'm, I am making it sound quite easy and there, and there are elements of this which are easy. You know, it's, it's, always worth checking yourself before you blindly copy a competitor that's that's an easy best practice and that's quite easy to do but to be distinct and to create marketing that really resonates is very difficult the best practice here is to go back to your positioning um april dunford's written extensively about good positioning so it's louis grenier who i know you've had on the show sam um and and really the idea here is to find what you do what, what your product does, what your service does, which is you, unique to the audience you're servicing. So with, different, with distinctiveness, it's not about being different. It's not about just changing your, your clock type to 10.30 rather than 10 past 10. That, that won't work. It's about finding how you uniquely service the audience you're going after and about how you can talk about that in a unique way that nobody else can talk about because you're servicing that audience in a, in a very unique way. Great example that I love of... of just unique positioning, which doesn't seem too distinct, but it, it just stands out, is Loom. So Loom is a, a company, a SaaS company, which allows you to quickly record videos of yourself, upload them to their site and share them with other people. Now, the typical way a marketer would talk about that, or the typical way the market has talked about that sort of technology before, is to say, we have got high quality video, which automatically uploads um, to the internet, Heaps of memory, which you don't even have to pay for, it's free. You just talk about all of the technical benefits of the product. But Loom went beyond that. They understood what they uniquely offered to their audience, and they were able to create positioning, which was actually quite distinct. So rather than saying, we give you really high quality video recording, they say, you never need to have a meeting again. Or they say, you never need to do a phone call again. So it's finding that unique message that you can use to your audience. And that's difficult. That involves interviewing at least seven of your customers or, or your ideal customer personas, trying to understand the language they use, trying to understand the, the problems you solve, and then framing your message in, in that term. Yeah, ex exactly like you said. If you haven't yet, check out the the episode. I think it was one or two prior to this with Louis, where we, Louis Grenier, where we did talk about basically interviewing ideal customers and identifying what he called the, the bleeding neck problem in your industry. Um, and then utilizing that in your key marketing message right so a bit like you, you touched on there because at the end of the day phil and i guess you'll agree with me here is if, if people go onto a site or an ad see an ad of yours and you're just rambling on about features and benefits that everyone's heard of a hundred times in industry jargon it, it usually just it's all me 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 send you to sleep whereas just like you've you've mentioned there loom have probably pulled on something that their audience especially during covid they're probably sick and tired of endless meetings um, so it sounds like they've really pulled on something that's a massive uh, frustration for their customers and just played on that with their, their headline, their, their, their USP, their tagline. And it's, it sounds like it's worked really nicely. So is, is, yeah. is that what we need to do here? That's exactly right, Sam. And I think, I think part of it is an element of confidence as well. So you'll notice this a lot. Whenever you go onto a, a site, a website, which is run by an individual like um perhaps sam like the website that, that you'll run for the company you own you know there's there'll be elements of that which which stand out far more the messaging will be a bit more punchy the, the language will, will catch your attention a bit and i think that comes from confidence when you're running your own business when you're running your own project it's easier to be confident to be a bit less risk averse and to be a bit out there with the messaging you're doing 
when you get into larger organizations where there are more stakeholders, where there are more bits of feedback, mm. where there's a CEO or hippo in the room saying, oh, I'm not quite sure we should do this, or competitor X does it this way, or our stakeholders or our shareholders do it this way, it's yeah. much more difficult to be confident. So a big thing that I would advise marketers to do is to educate themselves on this stuff, to really go out there and understand how consumers make decisions, to understand the Bond Restaurant effect, to understand why distinctive marketing pays off. And then you can start to be the advocate for this within your business. There must be somebody at Loom, I imagine. Maybe I'm completely wrong here. But I do hope there's somebody at Loom who understands that, who understands the value of distinctive positioning has advocated for that and that's allowed them to, to be out there with this marketing. And, and look, Loom's one example, there are there are hundreds of others. One of my favorites is, uh, you'll know this company, Sam, compare the, the market in the UK. Sure. So compare the market or a utilities comparison provider. So you go to compare the market to see what's the best deal you can get on your energy supplier. It's kind of boring. It's not particularly interesting. But 10 years ago, uh, there was a huge rush in this space as the websites became massively popular and um, the ability to switch between energy providers and utility providers became easier there was a big rush to, to, for these types of sites and there were five or six major sites competing for market share confuse.com um, compare the market.com um, money supermarket.com heaps of others those in the uk will recognize all of these brands and at the time 10 years ago all of their marketing was identical they all spoke about how they can save you more money about how they can get you quotes faster than anybody else and about how their website is simple and easy to use. That will sound really familiar to anyone in SaaS because we use the exact same benefits. (laughs) We're cheap, we're easy to use, we've got great UX, you know, all these things, we all say the same thing. And then compare the market, somebody or the the agency that they were working with said, look, the real winners here aren't going to be the people who just shout about the same benefits. The real winners here are going to be people who, who maybe have a bit of confidence and, and try and stand out. So they completely changed their marketing campaign. They created a, a, a meerkat who complained about the fact that comparethemarket.com was stealing SEO and clicks from his site, the meerkat site, which was comparethemeerkat.com. <laughs> and as we all know, a 10-year, 20-year, 15-year, however long we'll go on for, it's still going today, marketing campaign kicked off, which smashed all expectations. Within eight weeks, they hit their 12-month goals, and they became the number one searched for site within that market. And that's a real lesson for SaaS, because it's it's a very similar uh, model which is going on here. Lots of companies, all competing for market share, talking about the same benefits. One company breaks the mold and actually tries to do something different, captures market share very, very quickly. Do you know what's really funny about this story, though? All of those other companies I mentioned, moneysupermarket.com, confused.com, they all did the exact same model. So they all chugged away their benefit-led, value-led messaging as well, and then they all created opera singers that talked about utility providers. They created men dressed in high heels, dancing and talking about the great deal that they've got, all of this stuff. So... Um, it's it's fascinating. It's 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 really interesting. But when it do, when done well, hey, the results speak for themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's a really awesome example. I like that. Um, cool. So moving on, Phil, is there a way that let's say we've kind of u- uniquely put together a way that we can say that this is how we serve our audience, rather than just going through the traditional route of le- listing features and benefits? We've we've got some kind of unique value proposition here to make our brand stand out somehow do is the next step to start looking at some nudges that we can implement um or is is there something else that we need to consider first off yeah i think if we're talking about positioning the next step has got to be to speak to to customers which is interesting from like a consumer psychologist side, um, standpoint, you could read a lot of books about consumer psychology and think I never need to speak to a customer again because I've got all this information <laughs> on, on how they're, on how our brains work. So I should never speak to a customer. But if you speak to any consumer psychologist worth their salt, I spoke to Patrick Fagan on my show, who was previous employee at Cambridge Analytica. You know, this is, a, this is somebody who may never think that they actually have to interview a customer. They've got all this data and he's a firm advocate of actually speaking to customers. There's so yep. much you can learn from talking directly to them. Um, and the golden rule of speaking to at least seven, I think is vital bef- to check your positioning to see if if your messaging will resonate. Um, and then the experimentation culture, then actually testing out your messaging, um, whether that's on split test landing pages or Facebook ads or wherever you want to do it. That's another vital element to it. Nudges is, I don't think it's something you sprinkle on at the end, like, 
you know, a bit of icing sugar on top of a cupcake. For me, nudging is is it's really the ingredients behind all of the marketing sort of ideas and, and my understanding of how marketing works. So whenever I'm working on positioning or messaging at Hotjar or maybe for my own projects, I'm constantly referring back to some of the biases that I know consumers have. And I'm I'm using that to give me a leg up in the in the work I'm creating. So it's very easy to start writing an email or to start writing a blog without real purpose in mind, without real understanding of a goal you're trying to achieve. But if you go in there with an idea of a, a bias that you maybe want to utilize or, or a nudge that you want to you want to embrace, then you can actually start to create content that I think resonates a bit a bit more. So uh, examples, I've been I've been trialing this out with the podcast I run, so nudgepodcast.com. Um, I'm doing lots of different experiments to see if I can grow the audience size and to test out some of the stuff that I talk about on the show. Uh, social proof. It's a great example. So social proof isn't just logos on your website. It's much more than that. There's endless science which says we follow the actions of others. If you walk down the street and you see five people looking into a shop window, you cannot resist looking into that shop window. So showing people that others are taking an action can be really compelling, can really drive action themselves. So I've tried this um, in my own work. Very recently, I, I hit 100,000 downloads for my podcast. So I thought, well, that's great social proof. Let's test that in a split A-B test uh, on an email header. Tried it out with my email list. Lo and behold, if you put um, the name of the podcast, which which the episode which just launched, and then put in brackets, oh, plus we just hit 100,000 downloads, that email header with the social proof in it got double the amount of open rates. Did it with Reddit ad re- ads recently as well. So I tried a Reddit out, ad out for, out for Nudge Podcast. Both of the ads had the exact same copy. So he said, listen to Nudge Podcast, great podcast for consumer psychology. Actually, you, you said it best at the start of the show. So it's pretty much the, the message that you led at the start of the show. But the thing I changed, the thing I split to test social proof was the image. One just had an image of the podcast yep. logo. Another had the image of a logo surrounded by some of the most recent reviews I've got. Okay. If you understand the science, you'll know that this should be more successful. And it is. The click-through rate was higher. The cost per click was lower. The engagement was much higher. And ultimately, that one tweak to that advert drove much higher results for, for a much lower cost. And so it's it's not this sort of sprinkling on top. For me, nudging is the inspiration that I use for multiple different types of, of, of campaigns and, and at the core of, of the majority of campaigns I put together, both personally and at, at Hotjar as well. Nice. So it sounds to me a little bit like conversion rate optimization um, in, in a, from a website guy's point of view, making, whether it is, like you say, Phil, small changes to your landing page, whether it's changing your headline, adding different forms of social proof, whether that's reviews, whether that's testimonials, maybe you've got a case study video, maybe you've got a podcast review, whatever it might be, changing the color schemes of things, changing your call to action button, maybe from submit the inquiry to get your free quote now, um, and all these kind of subtle changes that just whether it's a landing page boost conversion rates or whether like you quoted on um, changing the email head le- heading or the uh, ad heading, just small tweaks that can kind of draw people in at that level of perhaps other people are, are enjoying this. Um, and an uh, example I sometimes like to use, which I'm pretty sure I stole someone is with social proof. It's like when you're abroad, when you're on holiday, so I can say, for example, when I was in Thailand a couple, couple years ago with, with my missus, we were just walking past a bunch of restaurants. And it's that dilemma when you're walking down a street, you never know which one to eat at. Because first of all, you've never been down the street before. And it's like, well, what food do we want? And then you usually tend to go for, you skip the restaurants that are really, really quiet. And then you go for the one that's kind of got, they've sat people purposely right at the front to give you that feeling that it's busy, that other people are enjoying it, that it must be great. So psychologically, I think, well, that food must be awesome. Turns out this one was shit, but we still went in there because of the social proof. <laughs> exactly. Hey, and if you take a world famous uh, violinist who's selling out the Royal Albert Hall for for tickets that cost hundred pounds plus, put them in Hyde Park Corner and have them perform in a tube station, they won't make more than ten pounds. Social proof yeah. is is massive, um, and, and and you know conversion rate optimization is 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 great. It's definitely an element of nudging and. 
you know, Hotjar really does help with conversion rate optimization and we use it a lot and, and do that sort of understanding and, and gain that understanding. But I do think understanding behavior science and consumer psychology, it gives you more than just the small improvements. So I mentioned sure. this to you at the start, uh, Sam, but, you know, there's this whole idea of reciprocity. So Cialadini talks about this. This is one of his six laws of of persuasion um, and this idea of reciprocity if you give something you are more likely to get something in return and this idea can help inspire campaigns that can really drive growth for your business so I took this idea and thought how can I inspire a bit of reciprocity amongst my podcast listeners um, so I thought well why don't I try and create a course um, a course which can actually help combine all of the different things that I'm talking about on the podcast and put it into one easy it's around five hours length of the course, but one solid place where you can get an understanding of all of the things that, that you need to know to understand the basics of consumer psychology. I did. It's called the Science of Marketing course. You can check it out by going to nudgepodcast.com and clicking on courses. But I wanted to use a bit of reciprocity. I wanted to use this nudge to help me grow the show. So rather than, rather than charge for the course, I thought, well, I'll give the course away for free, but I'll make sure that in order to get access, listeners have to leave a review of the podcast. So that little bit of reciprocity, that little bit of playoff. Since launching the course, I've got over 100 five-star reviews for the podcast, a huge number of reviews, which, you know, puts Nudge up there with it's some of the reviews of, of shows, well, which... Because it takes a long way time bigger to than, get reviews for podcasts. Exactly. And way bigger than the size of my show should justify. I'm, I'm hitting above my weight there. I wouldn't have known to do that. I wouldn't have had the confidence to do that if I hadn't read about Cialadini's rule of reciprocity, if I hadn't understood the science behind reciprocity, if I hadn't been confident that this sort of thing would work. It's a much bigger play. It's a much bigger risk. It's it's not an optimization. It's it's a it's a it's a big campaign. Sure. But it, having that understanding, understanding the science behind how consumers make decisions, gave me the confidence to do that, and fortunately, it paid off. Nice. Nice. And just to, to wrap things up, Phil, I think you've got a few nudge examples that businesses can think about, perhaps if they're new, small or startup. That, uh, was it the top three you've got that we can perhaps look consider straight away? No, I can give you I can give you dozens, Sam. How long have we got? <laughs> no, no, let's go for 100. <laughs> no, 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 we'll go for a few. We'll go for three. Uh, the three I really like. Uh, distinctiveness, which we talked about already. So Van, Van, Van Westeros effect, you know, find ways to make your brand distinct. You know, anything distinct, your messaging distinct, it will stand out. Uh, second is anchoring. Anchoring is incredible. Wow! If you if you if you're able to to anchor your price, you'll massively drive change. Um, there are endless studies that show this. I think my favourite is from courtrooms. Um, there was one study in a in a courtroom where um, uh, juries were shown three different, uh, the exact same case time and time again. The only difference was the lawyer would ask for payouts of different sizes. So this was a, a case where the, somebody was being sued and they were asking for a payout. Um, in one of the cases, the lawyer asked for like $100, the other $10,000, the other $100 million, the other a $1 billion, you know, extreme differences in the amounts that the lawyer was asking for in terms of a payout. You think there's no way this will affect the jury. You know, these differences are so different that there's no way the jury will change the amount that they think that should be paid out to this individual. It's not true anchoring has an effect and, and when you ask for a higher sum the amount they actually paid out increased by two three four times even though that high sum was ridiculous so find ways to anchor your price find ways to anchor your product steve jobs is is the king of this go look at his uh, ipad uh, keynote speech because what he does is he stands on stage and he says so many of you in the audience thought this would cost $999. You know, we've packed so much technology into the iPad. We did so much. It's a computer and a phone in one. It's reasonable to think it would cost $999. And he presses the, the ticker and behind him, the $999 smashes into a thousand pieces and the real price of 499 appears and the crowd are weeping, the crowd are cheering. What's hilarious <laughs> is the majority of people in those crowd actually predicted it would cost around 399 or 299 just a couple of days before. It was only a few that said 999. Is that so psychology based as well, Phil? So it's just yeah. sets up with that real high mark. And then when you see the, um, the result, it kind of sets you free. Because I think I saw a video the other day of something similar, actually. I think, um, is it the US shopping centre Costco they put real high value items right at the front of the store that no one will ever buy so like ma massively expensive TVs electronics all that kind of stuff just to anchor yeah. you as soon as you go in the store you think well that's expensive and then you start shopping you're like 
well, this stuff all seems cheap in comparison. Like, I'm going to buy my yeah. groceries. I'm going to buy this. I'm going to buy that. And I think they also do it with their chickens. Like, they do those actually really <laughs> cheap. So you get a cheap chicken, and then that encourages you to have happy shopping experience as you carry on. So there's a lot of yeah. brands doing this in quite uniquely unique ways. That's a classic one. Um, that's moving into price decoy effect. And ah, okay. the, econ- the economists were famous for this. They first did this. Check out um, Dan Ariely's Predictably Irrational book. He, he first picked this up back in 2008. Um, and he found that the economist, um, when they were selling their different subscription packets, they would have the magazine only, they would have magazine and online, and then online only. Mm. You would think the magazine and online would be most expensive. You're getting the two things there. But they actually charged the same amount for the online only. Think about that. Online only. So you're not getting the magazine and you're paying the same amount. So nobody's going to go for the online only. So why have they done this? Well, it's a decoy. By putting it as the same price, it makes that price seem more reasonable. And Dan uh, Dan Ariely tested this with his students. He showed that pricing and then pricing where the online only was removed. Yeah, And when you see the pricing with the decoy effect, people are far more likely to pay for the magazine and online offer because it looks good. It's like, oh, it's the same price as online only. It must be good. It's just a decoy and it just encourages you to spend more. So price decoy effect is another one. My final one, I know we said three is, is scarcity. I don't think I have to rave about scarcity on this show. Marketers will know it. But highlighting how your product is scarce can have a huge, huge impact. The day that Concorde announced that they were stopping flying, the, the amount of demand for those flights went through the roof. Nothing yeah. changed. There was no improvement in the service, no improvement in the speed time, no improvement in the meal you would get. It just became a scarce resource. So putting some sort of limit, some sort of scarcity around your product can, can have a huge effect. My favorite example here, what, if I've got time for one more, Sam, yeah, do yeah, I have time go, for one go more? Go ahead, man. Supermarket in Iowa, uh, experimenters wanted to encourage people to, to buy soup. So they put big banners up in the supermarket saying, buy soup. That works. Marketing works, Sam. If you put those banners up, people buy around three cans of soup on average of those who buy. Brilliant. Pat ourselves on the back. Oh, marketers, we know what we're doing. Put, put, put signs up. <laughs> uh, but if, if you put an asterisk on that yeah. and say sales limited to 15 cans per person, which is ridiculous, by the way, because nobody was buying 15 cans. If you do that, the amount of soup that people bought went up to four and a half cans just with that tiny asterisk, just with that terms and condition. And I love that example because That's it's so good. silly. That's shouldn't good. have had any if, effect, um, but it works. I wonder if supermarkets did that when COVID first hit the UK and everyone was going mad on buying toilet rolls. Yeah, I think they did, exactly. didn't they? That limited to, to three or four or something like that. And like, yeah, there's a big, big backlash effect. in the behavior science community, which actually said this, this won't work. It'll encourage more sales, especially if the <laughs> limit is really high. Like, oh, limited yeah. to 10 toilet rolls like no you're just going to encourage people to buy more are there any rules to that because um i think that some companies take um scarcity a bit too far um and i guess there probably is there's probably a line where people just think look you're taking the piss now you've said this is an offer for the last year um definitely isn't um so are there any kind of things that we need to consider before we start saying like if we're sending out a course on email that there's only five spots left and then people see that across five emails and they're thinking something's not quite right here. Well, yeah, don't lie would be the first rule. Yeah. I think that's rule number one. I think, you know, like as marketers, we should know more than anyone how annoying it is to get marketing emails, which just seem like bullshit. And I think mm. that if you want to build a community, a, an audience, a, a, a community of customers that actually rely on you, then you just got to stop lying. Um, I would advise a lot of people to check out Near Eel's book, Hooked. Many of you will already have. He talks a lot about the ethics behind using nudging and behavior science. And he's got a really good framework to just encourage you to check and see if what you're doing is, is ethical. And a lot of it relates to, is this something that is actually improving somebody's, somebody's experience? Would it improve your experience? And is it the sort of thing that you would want to experience yourself? If the answer to all of those isn't yes, then the thing you're trying to implement is, is probably not worth doing. And it's probably a bit unethical. Yep. Love it. Good stuff. We'll have to check out that book. Leave it in the show notes. Well, that is a good way to end, Phil. Look, really enjoyed the conversation, sir. Please do tell us more about how we can connect with you, how we can learn from you, and the best way to get in touch. 
Yep. So um, for the podcast, nudgepodcast.com, search for Nudge wherever you listen to podcasts, hit subscribe. Um, Sign up to the email list if you go to the website as well. That way you can get an email every time a new episode goes live. And I drop some tips in there as well, which are quite useful and handy to get. Uh, Follow me on Twitter, P underscore Agnew. That's A-G-N-E-W. I post heaps on there about nudging and also all of the new episodes. Um, Same on LinkedIn if you want to follow me there. And then Hotjar, fantastic tool for understanding and improving and implementing nudges and seeing how they work on your website. So do go and check out Hotjar. We've got a free freemium product, which anyone can use forever on their site. It's well worth doing. Um, That's just hotjar.com. So yeah, thanks so much for having me on, Sam. No worries, Phil. Really enjoyed the chat. We'll put all of those links over at businessgrowth.marketing in the show notes. Um, So thanks again for coming on. Um, If you enjoyed the show, be sure to hit subscribe wherever the heck you get your podcast from. We interview business leaders each and every week to provide actionable marketing tips to grow your business and grow your revenue. And with that, we'll catch you on the next episode.